plain and simple. And so they got to do what they got to do. And we have to realize that when we're trying to gather our news of the day. And if you only go to one place for your news every single day, then you're likely going to be screwed. You're going to have a very skewed view of the world. But if you flip around and and you get a vantage point over here and a vantage point over there, read some stuff over here, read some stuff over there, you get a better sense of that. But if you keep going, you keep reading, you keep watching, you're consuming information five hours, ten hours, and every way. Only somebody else's fault to tell. And that's when you have to do it. By the way, if you think I'm talking to you, I'm not. I'm talking to myself. Uh, this, this is stuff that I need to remember as I get more and more, uh, you know, I go through phases of getting caught up in the news. Uh, uh, a reminder to myself that if I spend 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, sitting through the uh, new so-called news, I do nothing to get myself for it. But the cool thing about it is, I eventually get to a point where I remember something, I realize something. And that is, I don't have any control over it. Either. And in the end, that, most of that news has no effect on me. No control over my life. No effect on me. Except the power that I give it. So, this is where I'd like to go to that great line from uh, Simon and Garfunkel. I'm going to go with the old hippie on you. Simon and Garfunkel from uh, Only Living Boy, New York. I get all the news I need from the world. I gather all the news I need. And go, that's not really what's wrong. I'm riddled with anxiety because of A, B, C, and D in my life. And it's just easier. It's easier to take it out on an orange-faced, orange-headed man up on a screen or or the evil Satan Hillary Clinton. It's easy to point and go, oh, that's what's wrong with everything. Oh, that's what's wrong with everything. Next time you find yourself doing that, start doing this. And going, ah. Ah, let me go into a room, get quiet, commune with whatever it is I think I believe in, and and stay there and stay quiet for a little bit. Welcome to the Wake Dot Show. It's starting off a, a little uh, a little broad, a little philosophical this morning. I don't know why. I like, again, I have a feeling it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with me. Johnny Torres, what are we doing tomorrow? Uh, well, eating. Well, eating. <laughs> are, are are we doing a remote show tomorrow? What's I think the so. plan Is that okay? Can we do a remote show tomorrow? So right. you're going to be remote from who knows? From who? All right, from points. <laughs> from we'll uh, see. We'll find out. Okay, from points unknown. Might and, just 
just go over to the airport and just hop on a plane. Um, come on, man. We all know you're going to Miami. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to uh, let's go back through some of the uh, news of the day. Speaking of which, don't uh, don't forget we were going to talk about you know Thanksgiving in Miami. Um, talk about uh, Thanksgiving in Miami. Yeah, remember we were talking about like a Hispanic Thanksgiving versus a traditional Thanksgiving. Man, just because your family does things weird doesn't mean all Hispanics do things weird. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'd say I'm a pretty good source on that. All right, so is there any uh, any uh, any live? chicken beheadings at your <laughs> or am i being completely uh no but they're no i don't know about chicken beheadings not at my place but uh sometimes there are pork roastings you know like full-bodied pork roastings, like a full of chong where you dig oh, a, yeah. dig a hole in the ground oh, and then you yeah. stick stick the uh, pig in there let it sit for, what does it cook for like 10 hours or something like that yeah absolutely and then uh, dig that bad boy up put some uh, rice and beans and black beans and rice in the side oh mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. you know it mm-hmm. um so in, in a Hispanic house, in most Hispanic households, when they're celebrating Thanksgiving, are is there turkey involved, or is it yeah. a completely different tradition? Yeah, so my family slowly has been kind of incorporating the more traditional dishes, uh, like sweet uh, sweet potatoes and, um, and stuffing, you know, but turkey's always kind of been a component of it. We've just kind of taken liberty with just about everything else. So. I, I love the new background. Back, back on I you. I know, man. I Check like that out. Look at that. I still got to get the camera right here. That, I don't, I'm that, not quite. Not quite centered? No, I just, I got to figure out this camera position. But I, but yeah, no, love the new backdrop. Um, so let's uh, let's get back over or go back over some of the stuff you should know that we uh, hit and uh, delve a little bit deeper into it. James Miller says an animal killed his chickens, damaged his home, so he killed it. All right, listen, I know that's not going to appeal to a lot of people, uh, but, I, you know, being from farm people and also being from uh, Ocoee, Florida, I I get it. But here's the thing. This man took the raccoon, put it in a cage, took it out into the lake, and drowned it. It's not like, you know, uh, where my where my parents or my, uh, my parent-in-laws, my in-laws live in uh, Pasco County. Uh, it's kind of a rural area. And they have a neighbor that will trap squirrels. And then he goes out there with a little twenty two while they're still in the cage and kills it. Now that bothers the crap out of me, right? That yeah. like when I when I hear that next door, it makes me want to go next door and grab the man by his neck, put him up against the wall, and keep squeezing until he can't do that again. Sure. Well, fish, maybe you're the sociopath in all of this. <laughs> I don't do it. I don't fantasize about it. It's a very it's a very fleeting feeling that happens there. And then I have to intellectually remind myself that there's there's nothing wrong with what that guy is doing it's wrong in my world but in the greater scheme of things uh a pest that he caught and he killed right there he didn't take it out somewhere and drown it he didn't take it into the house and torture the creature for a few days until it died right do you think there's a difference or there's not a difference yeah, no, there's a big difference. I mean, if you're putting an animal uh, down, right, because it's a nuisance, uh, because it's affecting the, um, you know, your property in some way, or, you know, if you have chickens on, whatever the reason is, I think you do it quick and swift and, and, and just be done with it. You don't kind of draw it out. And now that be- being said, I've, I, I've said, I've, I've done something that, you know, in my past Similar. that I wasn't very happy about, but it, I was a kid and I was just kind of doing as I was told. You, you, you inappropriately touched a raccoon. <laughs> That's right. Are you next on the list now? You and Charlie Rose? Yeah, the raccoon's about to put out a statement, uh, I think, later today. What'd you do that you're not proud of? No, we, so we had a huge uh, aviary in my backyard. So we, uh, you could literally walk into it. Wow. It was a little, it was a little square. It was probably about, uh, I don't know, maybe like five foot by five foot. Listen, Colombian, a chicken coop, <laughs> a chicken coop is not an aviary. A chicken coop is a chicken coop. Uh, so, uh, and uh, we had uh, parakeets and finch and all kinds of birds in there. Well, um, some rats somehow got into the aviary and, oh. and had made themselves uh, quite at home in some of the empty birds' nests. Well, empty because they had uh, consumed the birds that lived in there. And when we found out, the, the the problem was pretty significant. There was quite a bit of rats living in our aviary. And so um, uh, we proceeded to grab all the bird's nests that had uh, rat's nests in them, and we tossed them in a garbage bag. And uh, my dad proceeded to fill said garbage bag with water. 
Uh, so, um, and so you got you technically did the same thing, or your father? Sure, did something very similar to this guy. He, uh, but I wonder is is there an argument to be made? I'm not trying to necessarily defend this guy, but I also don't want to uh, take out everything on this guy. What if he thought what he was doing was the most humane way to get rid of that critter? It's a lot that that took a lot of effort. I mean, again, there's so many ways that he could have handled this, and I think he took maybe the most tedious way to to handle this. I mean, you figure he had to get on a boat and then drive said boat out. Yeah, he to, captured the animal. He could have called right. Could have called animal rescue. Yeah. Could have called you know um, pest control. Uh, but instead, he chose to kind of take this uh, upon himself to go out to a lake and 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 again uh, commit some sort of uh, I don't know I don't know, it's not a, I don't know if uh, I guess they're looking for him so it was or they caught him so it was a crime but yeah he was he was uh, arrested and taken into custody but then to play devil's advocate in the situation here what's the difference between what he did and then what pest control would have done or animal control would have done i guess uh the it would just have been more humane is all either a they would have i don't know what their policy is their policy is when they get the raccoons they take them to uh, raccoon island <laughs> there's such a place or if they're putting them down they're putting them down humanely where this guy is you know drowning he's taking and he's and he's, and he's what he's, he's gonna give up the cage too he's just he just dropped the cage into the water or do you have a string on it wait for the raccoon to drown yeah then bring it back up uh, but a woman, you know, watches going down. Well, it was a perfectly good cage. His yeah. neighbor, yeah, and took the, uh, uh, the woman said she told her neighbor that drowning an animal was inhumane. He should have called animal services. Uh, Miller replied, the raccoon was in my house and left the cage in the water for several minutes, killing the raccoon. According, and then the authorities uh, questioned his wife, and she said that, yes, the raccoon had killed some chickens and had later gotten into the uh, house, but he still was uh, taken into custody. I have uh, a similar story to Johnny Torres's from my childhood. It was not my father, but a buddy of mine's father. And uh, I want to say we, he was going to take us all to school that morning and turned on his van, heard a horrible sound coming from the engine, opened up the Ugh. engine, and a cat had a, uh, had a litter. Yeah. And, and, a, and they had gotten, you know. Gotten in the engine. Yeah, and they got uh, cut up pretty bad just that few seconds that the engine was on. So he, God, I can't believe we're having this. Con- I can't believe I'm talking about this at uh, seven thirty two in the morning. <laughs> I had a, I had a an, an, another similar story. But go ahead. Do, do, do we have a positive similar story? No. One where the uh, the, no. ra- the raccoons, so I don't even the rats know live. But here, here's what happened. So he put the kittens in a bag, a, a garbage bag, like you were saying, and then grabbed a cinder block. But for him, that was the most. And he, he, why, by the way, we didn't see this. He sent the cat, kids away. He sent us away. And he felt that was the most human thing because they were mangled. That he put them all in a, a black garbage bag and then a cinder block and just and you know I, wow. guess I don't need to act it out from there. Yeah. Um, I, again, I, that's a, a different category. Um, but I could see that story hitting the news and it and all of a sudden it making that man you know seem like a, a monster. Well, they're going to be waiting for us when we leave. You know that, right? Who's they? The, the raccoons. Man, the man. The what, man? No. I, <laughs> well, all right, we got, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four uh, s- sexual allegation stories to uh, get here. Some of them are, uh, some of these are new. Some of these are adding on to what we've seen. So let's start with Charlie Rose. Charlie Rose, Charlie Rose. Move that a little to the left. We've got these uh, new fancy schmancy graphics and uh, it's blocking. Like this? Yeah, a little bit more. Um. Yeah. There. You, there you go. Uh, the Washington Post. Let's Perfect. see here. In response to a Washington Post report detailing multiple accusations of inappropriate conduct, PBS and Bloomberg on Monday announced that both companies will stop distributing uh, Charlie Rose's show. Charlie Rose, the nightly show, is produced by his company. Separately, CBS announced that Rose is suspended from his role as CBS This Morning co-host. Rose is also a contributing correspondent to 60 Minutes. Quote, Charlie Rose is suspended immediately while we look into this matter. matter. These allegations are extremely disturbing. And by the way, would you rather... I'm sorry. No, I wouldn't. No? (laughs) Charlie Rose. No, would you rather the crooner microphone than that microphone? Because the crooner microphone, the one that's right over my uh, right shoulder here now, has an on-off switch, so you can technically use that as your cough button or eating button. 
<laughs> if you want, if you want, since you don't have control of your own volume over there, you know. Well, and I, I do love to sing, and you do so, love to sing. So it'd be perfect because it would fit me as a personality. All right, we we might we might have to which you know switch those out and just see how that works for you. I think that'd be fun. Um, the Washington Post spoke to eight women for the story about Rose, which focuses on his treatment of Charlie Rose employees between the nineties and two thousand eleven. None of the women worked for CBS or PBS, according to the report, and PBS and CBS and Bloomberg all told the newspaper that they, quote, have no records of sexual harassment complaints about Charlie Rose, unquote. Uh, quote, PBS was shocked to learn of these uh, deeply disturbing allegations. We are immediately suspending da, da, da. Now, most of the women said that Rose alternated between fury and flattery in his interactions with them, which is... Uh, if true, is very indicative of a controlling personality, uh, that they are flattering one second, go into a fit of anger the next, apologize and say, oh, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What I meant by that, hey, I love you. Five described Rose putting their uh, hands on their legs, sometimes their upper thigh in what they perceived as a test to gauge their reactions. Two, have you ever done that? Have you ever just put your hand on a... On a woman's leg just to gauge her reaction? <sighs> Probably. Probably. Yeah. Two said that while they were... No, somebody... Uh, uh, <laughs> two said that while they were working for Rose at his residences or were traveling with him on business, he emerged from the shower and walked naked in front of them. That seems to be a common thing amongst these predators. The, you know, now that Weinstein, you mentioned it... Just, they just appear in robes. Uh, Steven Seagal, Harvey Weinstein, this guy. We'll just show... Just be ready for fornication. Yeah, now that you mention it, uh, there does seem to be a pattern here, you know, and like many psychological conditions, uh, you know, that, that, that could be, you, I think you could be onto something. I mean, I would think that a sexual therapist would probably agree with you that there's, you know, similarities in behavior here. There are some kind of telltale signs that these guys need help. Probably. And I would imagine a, a lot of guys will show some of these telltale signs, but still not cross lines. Still be, sure. you know, a, you know, a very flirtatious or, um, you know, I was, I've been, you, you know, we've been talking a lot about this over the past couple of weeks now and, uh, or has it been longer and, and it's been interesting off the air, off public discussion when you're having private discussions with people, um, the reactions to this and it's, I don't say it's 50, 50, but it's a definitely a mixed bags, uh, a mixed bag, um, with a lot of people going right to defending, like not even wanting to hear the allegations, like Morrissey yesterday, and trying to defend Kevin Spacey. It, Morrissey's point about some women know exactly what they're doing when they're playing this game and trying to get roles and da-da-da-da, and he said that some of these women are just disappointed in their career, so now it's turned into assault or harassment because uh, their plan failed. Their plan to seduce their way into the movies or music or wherever politics has failed. So even if he has a point, which he does, you you don't use that broad point when you have how many allegate ten, over ten or over twenty now with Kevin Spacey. And I love Kevin Spacey as an actor. I mean, I don't know him personally. I interviewed him once uh, in 1999 or two, whatever it was yeah. for. Uh, uh, I think it was American Beauty that he was pimping at the time, mm -hmm. but. And it, and it sucks. And it sucked to see his name associated with this kind of stuff. But I've also been, you know, hearing these jokes for years about Kevin Spacey. And one of the more famous ones, or, or more popular ones, that were out there was a uh, a joke Family Guy did, where Stewie's running naked, going, "Help me, help me! I just got freed from Kevin Spacey's basement," or something like that. But those jokes came because of the rumors that were swirling about Kevin Spacey in Hollywood. Yeah. And Seth MacFarlane take he doesn't give a damn, and he'll take, well, and he'll take those jokes and run with them. Well, and he's he's kind of been on the money a few times. Um, you know, not only with this Kevin Spacey thing, I think there was also he, he did a Harvey Weinstein he did a joke Weinstein too. joke at an award show. Yep. Uh, something about not going to his hotel, or was that Courtney? Lo I, all right, I'm confusing stories now, and it doesn't really matter. <laughs> uh, my point is this is that uh, a lot of men are getting defensive. And at first, it kind of irks me when they immediately try to pivot the conversation onto, uh, well, women do this, women do that. Because this isn't, this isn't about a battle between the sexes. 
and all of a sudden women have the upper hand and they're making and they're making uh, inroads and you have to shut it down um this is about something that's been going on for a very long time this is about power um this is about um control and and also about the other side of that coin on what we as humans will allow to happen to ourselves or to someone that we know and not say something about it or not change our ways. Um, or no, if something will happen to yeah, yeah, ourselves or somebody else and we don't allow it because the person that is doing this is the one with all the money, all the control in that moment, in that environment. So you sit there because... It was kind of borderline. There's a grayish area. She kind of was in a flirty mood. I can see how that eh, is that stuff even true in the moment or are in that moment we justifying why it is that we're not stepping in and saying something. Yeah. Now, there's been plenty of times in my uh, life that I have stepped in and said something, but there I'm sure 10 times more, 100 times more times in my life that I didn't step in and say something. And, you know, I think about all those times in the golf course because I'll bring that up when I'm playing with people that I don't know, being a radio personality here in the Bay Area for a long time. Uh, you have a tendency to get, get out and play golf with all kinds of different people. And, uh, and, it, and it really surprises me to this day, once somebody gets comfortable with you on the golf course, the stuff that will come out of their mouth. Now, that being said, if you've ever played golf with me, you've heard the most inappropriate, amazingly shocking stuff come out of my mouth. Uh, if I offended you in those moments, I do apologize. Um, in those moments, uh, that was during a time period where I was in a what everything that came out of my mouth, I feel like for 15 years, 10 or 15 years, was there was something driving it, which how how shocking can I be in this moment? How inappropriate? What line can I test in this moment yeah. to get a get a reaction out of people? And you go, well, fish, that's the problem. You're the problem. That mentality. Hey, 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 I'm sorry. Just realizing it now. I'm just realizing it with the last couple of years that I had gotten way off track my my own personality. Like for those people that went to school with me and they would catch up with me, you know, in my 15, 20 years later, they were just shocked by what kind of, I was a different person than I was in high school, graduating high school. They would recount these stories of how nice and sweet and polite and I would I, I didn't drink, I didn't do drugs, all this stuff, and all of a sudden they catch up with me 15 years later and they're like, you've done what? You did what last night? And it's because once I got into radio, got into the media, I was rewarded for being shocking. Well, that's what I was going to say is that we've talked about this before and especially over the last 17 years, you know, the the standard was such that the more shocking the better. Right. The more inappropriate then, the better. Then what happened 17 years ago? You said for the last 17 years. Yeah, no, I mean, since or maybe even before you, that. No, I'm just saying that. Well, I, you know, I thought you were pointing to either 9/11 or the Janet Jackson incident. Uh, it was probably the Janet Jackson incident. I that, mean, I wasn't. Uh, yeah, that it cracked that uh, knocked cracked that door. Maybe. Yeah, cracked exactly. Where door. we kind of were like, wait a second, let's kind of pull back a little bit. But again, here in Tampa Bay Radio, when I was just getting started, and even before that, what five, maybe five or ten years before that, uh, you know, there was a standard here in this market where the more shocking, the more uh, ridiculous, outrageous uh, that you could be on the radio, the better. And that was really what everybody was pushing towards because that's the only way that people were getting any attention. Stuff that would be normally be considered sexual harassment and inappropriate in the workplace is was allowed and still is allowed on in, ra in on radio shows, like in the studio. Oh, oh this is for entertainment. It's for entertainment. It's for entertainment. It's for entertainment. It's for ratings. It's for ratings. Okay, okay, okay. Keep going. But then, uh, once you wander out of the studio, that kind of stuff is not allowed elsewhere in the building. Right. Um, so, you know, so and that's hard, man. That's that's uh, that's really hard to enforce. I mean, you you can't. It's one of those things that once you let that animal out of the bag, it's really hard to put them back in the cage. Right. Because the people that are listening to the radio that work in your building don't always separate the two. 
And what I'm talking about are new, usually new salespeople, not the not the managers necessarily, the people been in the building a long time, the newer sales staff. So they start interacting with, and it's not about me. It was about the uh, those people who played the was it subservient the 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 lesser role the the you beat them up or they're the stunt boy on the show or stunt girl on the show, right? And then producers, we, interns, yeah. Then they would leave and have other people in the building treat them inappropriately, right? And by that, I mean they were treating them exactly the way I was treating them on the radio. But I was being rewarded for it. I got uh, you know bigger raises because ratings were com- bigger ratings were coming in. And the other people in, on the other side of the building are having conversations. Hey, you can't talk to that person like that when they're off the air. Well, and they also, a lot of the other people in the building, because they're not on that side of the microphone, oh, is... Yeah. Uh, is, yeah. oh, sh- I, hey, wait, hey, we can do this. Uh, sugar and cream. Thank you. And 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 if you've got any ice cords, if you got any ice, put a little ice in there. Can I get I, some croquetas and some buttered toast and a café con leche? Well, if you're uh, if you're if you're bringing in croquet, uh, croquettes, look, just make a croquetes. La Bamba run. He just needs to make a run to La Bamba. That's all he needs to do. Can you can you throw on that? What was that? Little, can you throw on that accent again? Croquetas, <laughs> croquetas, croquetas. Those Ca- are delicious. Café con leche. leche. And that's delicious too. Um, all but right. my point, my point was, is that they don't delineate between reality and the show. They don't understand that once you go into that studio, you are putting on a show. You are a personality. You but look are- at the show that a lot of us put on, and that that were considered that in that shocking category. It was very much a a very hyper competitive, hyper dominant frat boy mentality. Yeah. And if you walked into that room as, as a female, then you expected almost that you were going to be sized up. That who, when you walked in, you know, especially if you're coming in to promote the Hooters calendar or whatever, that you know that host, as soon as you walk in the door, is going to go, Ugh. all of a sudden you're going to see in his face, Ugh. Oh, I'm an antisocial radio geek who couldn't get girls on my own, but now that you're in my cave, looky, oh, you're so sexy, and I get to talk to you like that. Because you're a Hooters girl and you came you came in here to pimp your calendar, so you're already sexualizing yourself. So don't act like I'm crossing any lines or being inappropriate. Is the mentality? Yep. But is there? Can you delineate? Is there a difference there? Do you still? If a Hooters girl is coming in to pimp her calendar and her hoots are hanging out, are do you still treat them with the same respect as your next guest that's coming in from Mothers Against Drunk Driving and she's in a suit? And you're having a serious conversation about her, uh, about a serious matter with her. Well, and again, I think there are people that know how to draw the line. There are people that know that once you're in that studio, you are one person. It's a show. You are a personality. And then once you walk out of that studio, you are just like any other employee in the building. The problem is, is that I think uh, like actors and like you know musicians i think oftentimes they forget how to put that personality aside or that performer aside and then they try to embody the very person that they portray themselves to be on the on the air right um so let's get back to a charlie rose's statement now because charlie rose is a respected journalist not somebody who man i mean you're surprised when you see something like this am i surprised when i uh, saw the reports from bill o'reilly no it doesn't mean I know anything about Bill O'Reilly. Just uh, it's one of those human things when I see him up there and he is a alpha male that constantly dominates. Not an alpha. See, I feel like that's doing a disservice to true alphas. Yeah. Because a real alpha is not a loud, obnoxious prick. A, a true alpha controls a room without saying a GD word. And I'm not talking about stares. There is just something. And an alpha doesn't have to be a male. Yeah. Somebody who is a true alpha, there is something about them that you cannot teach. Well, I take it back. You can teach, and then it can be bastardized, and it can be uh, a retarded. Eh, I need to pick and find a different word than retarded. What do I mean? Bastard, contorted. It can be twisted, mangled. Sure, yeah. And, and so those who are not alphas can learn the, some alpha traits, but those are the ones that turn into the a-holes, I think, because they are not true alphas. And so when I would watch uh, Bill O'Reilly and then you find out of all these allegations, yeah, you're like, oh, I can see that, right? It has nothing to do with his politics or anything like that. 
But then Charlie Rose seems like the opposite of that male. Sure, yeah. Like I would expect the intellectual. To, yes, I would find uh, I, I like the more I, even keeled. Right. I, I yeah. would expect a story to come out that's weird, but in, in a different category when it comes to Charlie Rose. Yeah. So here's his statement. Remember now, this is eight women. This isn't one or two. Yeah. This is eight women that the Washington Post uh, dug up. He says, in my 40 years, 45 years of journalism, I've prided myself on being an advocate for the careers of the women with whom I've worked. Nevertheless, in the past few days, claims have been made about my behavior towards some former female colleagues. It is essential that these women know I hear them and that I deeply apologize for my inappropriate behavior. I am greatly embarrassed. I have behaved insensitively at times. And I accept responsibility for that, though I do not believe that all these allegations are accurate. Accurate. I always felt that I was pursuing shared feelings. That's the line I have issue with. That's the line I have an issue with. He, if you if you think you are pursuing shared interests, you you you're you're misreading signs, and you go in for it. So he goes and he puts his hand on the leg because he goes, I think I might be feeling something here, sensing something here. So his hand goes out, and he puts it on the uh, the leg of a woman. By the way, I although this is stuff that no, come on in, Cords, you can bring it right. I, I don't mind at all. This is this Man, is uh, this is raw full service today. Thank you, sir. It's a awfully cute pink monkey you got there. Mm. Is there uh, is there an HR because uh, Johnny Torres is talking about my pink monkey right now? <laughs> There's a story behind this mug. Uh, what? Let me see it. Steak dinner. Oh yeah. Presents presented by GTA. What's the story behind this? Well, mug? it's a little shout out to the Boys and Girls Club of Tampa Bay. We uh, we got that mug uh, after live streaming uh, their big fundraiser for the year. And uh, will you tell them it's ridiculous? <laughs> who, who ever heard of a left-handed mug? Huh. Look, I, uh, who ever heard of a left-handed mug? Hey, man, watch it. Left-handers, left-handers are in the building. Uh oh, you creative types. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Sound like a coffee commercial over there. On the spectrum of inappropriate behavior all the way to, like, sexual assault. Um, the putting the hand on the leg of somebody that you thought might be interested is way on the lower end. In the inappropriate, maybe. But here's the thing, man. We The, the ages are changing. Where there was a time where... Uh, it was taught to us to be to be assertive, not aggressive, assertive. And a woman wants a man who is assertive. Well, for those of us that aren't really assertive in the uh, female category, that's a difficult thing for us to accomplish. So you try. You're trying to be more assertive. You're trying to find ways to be more assertive. And then you might be awkward, awkwardly assertive, like, oh, I'll put my hand on her leg. And I, I, I don't... I'm... If these women, I, I don't know, I don't know the full stories. So if these women is in that moment felt extremely awkward because he was driving down a dirt road, you know, somewhere off the, like, uh, like Roy Moore taking you out in the middle of nowhere, and this is uh, happening, that's one category. If you're in between point A and point B of a convention and he thought that you guys were hitting off that weekend, so he put his hand, again, we need to have that conversation. Go, okay, that's no longer appropriate. Stop, stop. We're not doing that anymore. All right, guys? Yeah. Don't step in for a kiss anymore. Yeah, just don't do it. Um, if you really want to kiss, if you are in that moment compelled to reach out and just kiss a woman, we were taught to go after it, Johnny. Yeah. No, you're right. We were taught that's what it would go after it. If she's, if she pulls, Oh, I'm sorry. I misread some signs, but you, you, you go right in for it. Yep. Um, no, don't, not anymore. Don't do it. I'm not saying, don't get angry about it either. Because finally, women in mass are coming forward. No, Fisher, this is all left wing media making this bigger than it actually is. Well, it's it, not that bad. And it goes to show you that this really, this is out of anybody's control. Because there are people, all kinds of people getting thrown under the bus, right? And so if you did, if you were going to follow the even that narrative, it's saying, oh, this is some media thing against Roy Moore and blah, blah, blah. I mean, they wouldn't be throwing Charlie Rose, of all people, under the bus. Uh, because, honestly, unless there were eight women, right? I think it's eight of them. Yeah. Nobody would believe it. 
Well, even the Roy Moore thing, which has been really politicized in Alabama, uh, this is the guy running for Senate there and uh, very contentious. Uh, but you have a lot of his supporters backing him up and not. Well, no, so, so 10 allegations could come out. 15, 20, 40. And they still would not listen to one of them because they believe this is politics and uh, that this is nothing. And you even had one pastor publicly out there talking about, oh, you want to talk about uh, how men are predators? Look at these women chasing these little schoolboys up and down the road. So you have a group of people, not just in Alabama, but across the country that have turned this into a gender war, have turned this into this is not real. We can't have a discussion about this one by one as these things come out. Because this is all part of a conspiracy by fill in the blank to fill in the blank. Um, but it's not going to be good enough this time, Johnny. Uh, we, you and I ha- keep talking about whether or not this will be a phase, all of this will go away, and things will go back to normal in Hollywood and in politics and in, uh, and in Silicon Valley. Will it... I, I, this feels like the winds of change. Yeah. And uh, and this is this this is going along with a lot of other things that are happening in our world right now. Um, and this isn't about traditional men's roles and traditional women's roles. If you want to have and by the way, it uh, tradition uh, traditionality is relative. Oh, tradition sure. is relative. So whatever tradition it's all you kinds wanna, of things. Whatever tradition you want to have in your house, if you want, if uh, the man is the king, the woman is the queen, and uh, you play your roles and you do your best to play your roles day in and day out, then knock yourself out. Um, I'd say be careful trying to force your children to be like you. Say, hey, this is the way I see it. This is the way I see it philosophically, why I think it's better for a family, better for our society. If you, as a man, traditionally try to stay in this lane and you as a woman, you know, knock yourself out. But in the end, it's going to be your choice. You're going to have to figure out because even though it's working for you and your, uh, you know, your wife or your husband doesn't mean it's going to work for your kids. But instead of telling them what they need to do and beating them and disciplining them, you could always set an example. No. You could always live the life you act like you live out in public. Just a thought. Just throwing it out there. <laughs> That's I, ludicrous. All right. So uh, <laughs> I haven't even finished uh, Charlie, uh, Charlie Rose's uh, statement here. I've learned a great deal as a result of these events, and I hope others will too. All of us, including me, are coming to newer and deeper recognition of the pain caused by conduct in the past and have come to a profound new respect for women in their lives. Um, This will be good enough for some people, not good enough for other people. Well, what's interesting is he seemed more methodical about it. Um, He seemingly was a professional in the workplace. Um, this didn't really seem to carry, he didn't seem to bring this into his work environment. All the women, right? Am I right? That came forward. Well, just because, uh, PBS and Bloomberg and CBS said none of the women work for them. It didn't mean that they didn't work for his Charlie Rose incorporated. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, these aren't just random women. I don't think. And also remember the Washington post was the, what the, the, the organization that dug up the stuff on Roy Moore in Alabama. And so immediately what those people do is they is instead of they look at the messenger and go, oh, well, the Washington Post. Well, that's Bezos. That's Amazon. Well, he's part of the conspiracy. (laughs) He's part of the uh, the the anti-America movement, you know. And then so anything that comes out of the Washington Post is immediately discarded. Probably the first one to throw Breitbart in your face. (laughs) A story off of Breitbart. Yeah. Um, But uh, I I'm also. Every time with every one of these stories and I go, all right, what's next? I feel like, okay, I I reevaluate my own career, my own life. Is anybody else doing that? Now, I wouldn't imagine everybody would. Uh, The one of the reasons why is because I realized that I was in a certain place of power in the media, just like Charlie Rose, just like a lot of these guys. I wasn't the the higher ups, the management or anything, but to be the host of a show, you are the top of a small pyramid there. And that period, you know, and and so it's had me evaluate and look back at the last 25 years and go, man, did I ever do any? I'm sure that along the way, I would imagine most of the stuff I did that was inappropriate and made people feel uncomfortable, Johnny, was probably on air. Oh, yeah. Not off air, but on air for entertainment purposes. Sure. Right. Uh, Because off the air, I'm the exact opposite. 
How, however, there is a story in my head that I have to sh- that I have to tell, but it doesn't. My my part in this story is I play the part of the guy that didn't say anything, and it's something that will will percolate, will bubble up to the surface every now and again, and I'll I'll feel disgusting in, in that moment, but I still have never done anything. And that is when a dear friend of mine, a good friend of mine, came to me and after she went out on a date with another friend of mine. And she goes, I think your friend raped me. Now, this has been years. Um, Her recollection of the evening is fuzzy. And she feels like she was slipped something by this person and I, I I, and that's it that's the end of the story I didn't follow up with her I didn't say is there is there something you'd like me to do is there something I can do I didn't go to him and go hey mf uh just talk to my friend and this is what she's claiming um, now the guy she's talking about isn't a close personal friend and it's not somebody I've even talked to in the last probably once or twice in the last five years but it's still somebody I know or knew and the the woman is somebody that I cared for and care for but I never said a thing Johnny that's tough I and by the way this is I, I, I'm putting it out there just because of the times that we're in because of me too and because I'm sure along the way there are things that I could have done differently. Uh, moments where I made somebody feel less than special. And, um, and in that, that, des- that destroys me inside. To think that I have multiple times over my life said things on the air, done things on the air. And this is just the stuff on the air that I'm thinking about. I, I, uh, the stuff off the like I'm waiting for that moment for an old, you know, somebody that was a part of the show go, you know, by the way, you remember this, this, and this? And I'll go, no. <laughs> no, I don't. Hey, do you remember when you put me on the air and we did? I, no, I, I don't. And by the way, that wouldn't be a lie. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be lying to you at that moment. I, 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 I mean, I'll, I'll get dozens of people to back up uh, any, any story. If somebody says, do you remember? And I, and I say, no, the chances are <laughs> I'm not lying. And I've always joked that I will take the the details of a story that happened in my life from a complete stranger that wasn't there and believe their version of my story more than I will believe my own story. Because I don't know why, but I have the I have a horrible memory um, when it comes to that kind of stuff. So, um, but I, I think this is part of the uh, the bigger discussion is evaluating who we are and what we want to be. Uh, as humans, as humanity. And uh, there's a shift right now in this, it, it seems, where what used to be allowed in this hyper-dominant culture of ours, the hyper-competitive, hyper dom- Well, why are you saying that? Why are you talking about dominance and competition like it's somehow tied into what we're talking about here? Well, I think it is. I think this all comes together. That, that do- constantly having to dominate every effing thing in your environment. I have to be the winner here, the winner there, the best that. I want that. I go get it. Why? Because that's what I do. I've been doing it all my life. I've been doing it for 50 years. I do it my way, and look where I am. I'm a billionaire. So how are you telling me that I'm doing something wrong? I will take what I want when I want. And that, that hyper-competitiveness that we beat into our children children starting at a very early age that there's no second place is loose is first loser oh come on man come on man this kind of stuff you got to remember sex isn't about sex sex is about power control and dominance and just look at look at the olympics every four years look at the olympics every four years what are some of the greatest stories that come out of the olympic village how many condoms they go through? Like, how the hell does this have to do? What does this have to do with anything? Because there is no group of people 
more competitive, more hyper-focused on winning and on being the best and the greatest than those that are training for the Olympics since they were one, two, three, four, five, six years old. So then all of a sudden they all get together in one place and there's another part of that that comes out because their parents and their coaches are on top of them. Because they, especially the female, they don't want them getting knocked up and uh, you know messing around before they get a chance to bring home the gold. They're on top of them twenty four seven. And I'm not now. Should we start working in jokes about the uh, uh, the uh, you know gymnastic coaches? And I don't mean the way that they're on top of their players. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So these people get all together in uh, one place, and next thing you know, and I can't remember the numbers, they go through a hundred thousand, two hundred, a million condoms in fifteen days. Hyper competitive or comp- competition and dominance and all all of that and sex for some reason I don't know I'm not I dropped out of college I don't know how it's connected but it's it is and here in our culture we promote we hyper promote and yeah I, I keep I keep throwing that uh, is that considered a prefix or is that uh, I keep throwing hyper at the beginning of stuff because competition's not bad uh, you know. Uh, wanting to dominate your environment. I don't want to use the term dominate because I feel like that, that can get out of control. By the way, what, what kind of comments are we getting on this uh, this morning? Have you looked? At, I know you, uh, Johnny, you've been tinkering around. We've, we've, we've messed around with the uh, set here. Yeah, we're in when, uh, you know, we had a little bit of technical issues this morning, but uh, we got those sorted out. Um, what are, are there some, so, is, are there some comments on, on what I'm saying here? All right. So uh, we had, uh, we had, uh, a post to the Crisis Center, Tampa Bay. We feel that it's relevant to the topic, especially with you sharing your uh, the story about your friend. Can we have them? On, uh, let's message. The, I would love to have them on either this morning or tomorrow. If they can come on this morning, we'll have them on this morning. Yeah, we'll see. I know uh, Cords because we're going probably, into the holidays. Yeah, I know and, Cords is probably listening, and we have some relationships over there. So yeah, we're going into the holidays, and this will be a good conversation to have for those people like uh, me that can have their uh, bouts with. Uh, uh, anxiety slash depression. This yeah. we are entering that time of year where suicide goes up, suicide rates go up. So yeah, I'd love to have them on. Yeah, we'll 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 shoot for this morning, if not for the maybe tomorrow. Okay. Um, and uh, so Chris, uh, good morning to Chris Brown. He says, "Don't worry, as an intern on the MJ Morning Show, the stuff you say does not compare at all. He was a complete a hole. He was like this all the time. Uh, look at him now as a human, uh, still a dick and not relevant." I don't know. I don't know Todd Schnitt that well. Uh, I don't have uh, positive. My my interactions with him are not positive. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I I could. I it used to. I used to say. Uh, you know, in my younger days, this was after he threatened me. By the way, this was after he called and threatened me. Oh jeez. About uh, what? Uh, I think I t- I'll tell you. I'll tell you here. In Make a, a short joke or something. Uh, no, I told you that he called. I didn't tell you this. He called me no. at a radio station no. after he gotten off the air. All right, I'll tell you the story in a second. All right, but I used to say about him if uh, he was on if he was on fire in the middle of the street, I wouldn't pee on him to save his life. Nice. I, uh, I as in now that, that I'm older, that's that's always a good one, right? And wiser, <laughs> I uh, I retract that statement. And if if he were on fire in the middle of the street, I would pee on him to, in an attempt to save his life. <laughs> uh, no, he it was uh, when I first came to Tampa in the late '90s. We were at Wild ninety eight point seven, and we had this bit called "Show Us Your Wild." And I want to say we gave a $25,000 first place prize uh, to the winner. And that was basically, there was a new radio station. Here's our logo. And people started painting their cars and their houses and all this stuff, right? All kinds of crazy ideas. Show us your wild. Well, in the beginning of this bit, nobody was doing anything. And so in order to get the juices going, you know, the creative juices in the listeners' minds going, we came up with a character that called in every day with an idea. That character's name was Todd Schnitt. Oh, now, but at the time in 1998, nobody, nobody knew that Todd shit. Sh- sorry, <laughs> slip of the tongue. I didn't. That wasn't per- on purpose. Yeah, it was- that Todd Schnitt was MJ, and so like now, you know, once he got his uh, AM talk show and stuff like that, people knew. But sure. So anyway, no, nobody knew that that was his real name. So the character's name <laughs> was Todd Schnitt. He called him every day with it. Like well, this happened for a week or two. And next thing you know, we get off the air. Me and my uh, morning show partner at the time, his name is uh, Nate Farmer, Napoleon. And uh, we're in the production room cutting promos. And the phone rings. And I pick it up. And he go, and I hear a voice go, is this Chris Fisher, Social Security? Christopher Michael Fisher, Social Security number. Blah, 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 blah. I go, yes, it is. He goes, is Nathaniel William Farmer in there, Social Security number? Blah, 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 blah. I go, uh, 
uh, yes, yes, he is. And then he goes on this tirade about how, uh, you know, I can keep playing around on the air, but he does all his uh, uh, off the air. Oh, like boy. he was going to come after me off the yeah, air. Yeah, right. So after that, of course, uh, you know, screw that little prick. And if he were on fire in the street, I wasn't going to pee on him to save his life, but things have changed uh, since then. So that's, I guess I do have an opinion about it, <laughs> Jake. It's not a good one. Uh, but the, I funny, mean, the I, funny thing, let me say this too about Johnny. I, yeah. I apologize. No, no, no. But let me say this, comparing uh, MJ and Bubba, for those of you in the uh, Bay Area, obviously that is a, a, a huge thing over the last 20 years, that, that rivalry, that battle, it's not any, anything anymore. But in my uh, experiences out in the public, when you were talking to people and they were talking about radio and they go like, hey, do you know this DJ? Do you know that? You know, all this stuff. I would say in the last 50, 70, 20 years, 20 years I've been in Tampa, I've had probably three total people tell me something positive about MJ, Tajnit, yeah. about their interaction with him. Yeah. Um, and most of the people have some story about him being an a-hole. Hmm. Bubba, on the other hand, which shocked me, shocks me yeah. because of his persona on the air, almost every single person I ever ran into had something good to say about Bubba. Right. Who have ever had a personal interaction. Not the people that are in the media, not the other people that are working in radio necessarily, but the people that uh, he would meet. Um, and that's just, uh, uh, I guess, my own uh, personal experience here in the uh, Bay Area. And so when, you, when I hear that comment that uh, MJ was a complete a-hole on and off the air, that seems to fit with things that I've been hearing over the last 20 years. Yeah, and it's interesting because, you know, you become friends with other people in the business, even if you don't work at the same radio stations. And, you know, I got to meet people that worked around him, you know, his old, his original Froggy, the, the producer, and uh, and Hurricane, and those guys. And, and those guys were with him for a long time, you know, and, and those are super nice guys. Uh, and while I did hear a lot of the same negative things you heard time and time again, uh, I never, I mean, I wasn't in that building for very long, but, uh, I mean, the only couple of interactions I ever had with him were, were fine. Like I never had a negative interaction and, but, uh, but, but I, I'll just back up what you said, which is that the popular opinion, uh, publicly is, is that he's just not a, a good person to deal with. All right. Uh, next enough about that for right now. I, man, we spent an hour. I did. I, and I, there's a part of me that wants to apologize. There's a part of me that wants to come in here uh, every single morning and uh, toss up soft softballs and just knock them out of the park and laugh and joke for uh, two hours. Uh, but I feel like that's partly how we got here, how we got to this place, how we got to 9-11, how we got to the uh, financial crash in uh, 2008, how we got to this moment because those of us in this kind of media – Brush by we 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 pull off the table the the harder things to talk about because so many people are tuning in in the morning uh, to their favorite radio station to their favorite Facebook live feed woo yeah. the wake dot show this is the wake dot show woo, woo, woo. make sure you share the wake dot show <laughs> um, which we've been terrible about telling people to do this morning. yes I'm horrible at that um I I I, I want to tune in to every radio station in the morning, at some point in the morning, and hear a moment of uncomfortableness where the person on the air just stops and goes, I don't know where we go from here. Depending on whatever the subject. Yeah. But, and you go, well, okay, well, that, that's awesome. Why, why don't they start doing that? Won't they go ahead and take on some more serious, they don't have to be serious all morning and bring us down as we're going to work because the, the re reality is most of the people that are going to work, what's happening? You're leaving the house and your wife's bitching at you. Out walking out the door. Make sure you do this. Make sure you do it. Did you do that? Nah, nah, nah. Your kids don't appreciate you at all. Have no respect for you whatsoever. And then you're getting ready to go to a job where that person has little respect for you. And it's yeah. working in every uh, six months is coming to you and putting another hat in your head and not giving you another dollar. So I understand why when people tune in to their favorite radio show, they want to hear what we, what we, my boss would always call superficial or surface content. Kind of like uh, just the frosting on the cake. Just give me the frosting. Um, just give me dabs of the frosting and then move on to some, play another song and then move on to something else. Because 
what's important to the media, to us. It's not that we are impacting our communities in a positive way. Can I keep you listening longer? Can I keep you watching longer so that the ad revenue that's coming in keeps coming in? So that's my frustration with us in the media. Um, and by the way, when, 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 you, when you're listening to these morons on AM talk radio or cable news, and they start talking about the media, the media, the media, the media is a big, broad, a big boat. There's a lot of different kinds of media out there. Mainstream media, mainstream, well, the mainstream media, really? Because you do, you have the you have the highest ratings of all the cable news networks and have for 15 years, but you call everybody else mainstream media media. Where the reality is, your mainstream media. If more people are watching you, your mainstream media. But it's about branding, and it's about it's about making money. It's an us versus them, and it's a very powerful thing. Us versus them is very powerful. Um, when you start a new radio show, a lot of uh, a lot of times the strategy is to go after the number one guy in town. So if you're starting a new radio show, you find out who's number one, who's number two, who's number three. And you start taking uh, shots at them on the air, off to try to get them to talk about you, and then and then you start this back and forth. Why? Because it's something that you can't control. Once I start an us versus them, you get on my side. Or if you're listening to your favorite morning show. And they start it. They, they they go at, at war, or they're going after something. All of a sudden, they are leading you down that path, and there's very little you can do about it. Why? Because your brain, the emotional centers in your brains, are reacting and making those decisions quicker than the prefrontal cortex can change those decisions. <laughs> That's why. And we're naturally competitive people. We we are by nature competitive, and we want to pick sides, which is why our politics has become more divided. Uh, you know, cycle after cycle. You say we're naturally competitive, but to a certain degree. That's why I like to throw in when we start talking about things getting out of control. The word hyper, hyper competitive, hyper dominant, yeah. right. dominant, hyper sexualization. Um, because on a on a small listen, I you know, growing up in the eighties, it was awesome. Uh, raw, raw America, red, white, and blue, Rocky, the Olympics man, crushing it. But you know, in 1984, 1988, when I see those gold medals, and this is when I, I'm in my teens, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, I see the USA crushing the rest of the world. I don't go, yeah, USA, we're the greatest ever. I'm like, man, I hope, uh, hope this country over here can win a couple of medals. I hope uh, uh, this country <laughs> over here can pull off. I, I am a root for the underdog kind of a person. So it is not in my nature to be hyper competitive. It is not in my nature to be hyper dominant. It is as a man. Well, it should be that fish. Maybe you're a woman. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe you and I can talk a little bit more about that off camera. I'll show you how much a woman I am. <laughs> no, I'm I'm tired of it, Johnny. All my life because I am not a hyper dominant, hyper competitive, hyper rapey. I'm not constantly talk. I'm not sitting there constantly grabbing my 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 own dick and going and after a woman walks out of the room, going, oh man, well, what I would do with her, what I would do with to her. I don't give a shit what you would do to her. I didn't give a shit when I was 16. I didn't care when I was 21, and I don't care when I'm 45 years old. So for those of you that are like that, please know that I don't care, and I'm not like you. I am not like you. And when I sit there across from people who are very powerful, people who are millionaires, and they're telling me how they can't control themselves, that every time a woman walks in the room, that's all they can think about. I don't get it. But I'm sick and tired of hearing that's how men are. That's not how all men are. That is how a lot of men are. That's not how I am. I don't know Johnny Torres uh, well enough to know if that's him or not. But it's not me, and it's not all men. And I'm sick and tired of listening to people go, well, men do this, all men that, all men this. No, all men don't sit there and think about sex all the time. Well, then you're not a man. Well, F you. I am a man. 
Oh, you might be a human male, but you're no man. All right. <laughs> I'm sweating this morning. I had a Roy Moore. So the uh, accuser of Roy Moore, uh, the 14-year-old, has come back forward. And she said she did not de- deserve to be preyed upon when she was 14 years old. Quote, I was expecting candlelight and roses. What I got was very different. I felt guilty. I felt like I was the one to blame. It was decades before I was able to let that go. I was a 14-year-old child trying to play an adult's world. And that's the key here because another thing that I'm tired of hearing of, hearing on the radio and on cable news and reading about, is how these women know what they're doing when they're 14 and 15 and 16. Definitely not. They think they know what they're doing. They are trying. They are trying to discover themselves. They yeah. are youth, transforming, making that transition into uh, adulthood. And so we got laws in the books here, in America, that during that phase of our lives, those who are already adults, those who already are smart enough to know how to manipulate most people in that age group, what motivates them. We've got laws in the book that says, no, sorry. My it, issue with all this, and I believe her, all right? And, and I think there's enough allegations there to say, look, this guy obviously uh, has a history of this. I'm not discounting any of that. My issue is the timing. Why now? Why this man has been in the public eye for his entire life. Because everybody, been a politician his entire she life. She finally feels safe. See, I don't buy it. I, I, I don't buy I don't buy the safety argument. I buy She says she's a Republican and always votes Republican. Okay, great. All right, so now this was so a this very isn't politi- contest- so this, this is a politically motivated. No, that's not true because this was a very contentious primary. And there were some very, very deep lines drawn in this primary. And there are some very powerful people behind these campaigns. Uh, th- there, there's already been talk. Mitch McConnell, from day one when these accusers came out, was already talking about a write-in campaign for somebody to replace Roy Moore. And so what I take issue with, not only with Roy Moore, but with Jack Latvala and with some of these other guys who are in political office, is the timing. And why does it have to be during an election? Why does it have to be during a campaign that these women decide to come forward? And And, and that's what bothers me. Why not come out five years ago, 10 years ago, right at the beginning of the political career when they could have put a stop to this, but instead they decide to wait until they reach a level of power that they deem suitable for them to come forward or maybe somebody stroking a check that, to kind of push them over the edge to, to, to uh, talk about it. Okay. Well, you're making a lot of allegations that are uh, completely made up. And uh, I'm not. I'm, and, I'm just uh, speculating. I'm well, not I'm making gonna, allegations. Give, well, I'm you, speculating. All right. Well, I'm going to give you some answers right here. Let's go. All right. Uh, first of all, the Washington Post uh, had stories on uh, uh, Roy Moore, had multiple women on uh, uh, Roy Moore, and they went to this woman, and she goes, well, when they wanted her to run her story, she said, no, you find other people, then you can have my story, but I'm not coming out by myself. When asked why she waited until nine to uh, now to come forward with the allegations, she explained that she had told people after the incident occurred, quote, my family knew, family friends knew, she said but that she wanted to protect her young children from the maelstrom she knew would follow. Quote, my children were small. I was a single parent, she said, expressing a desire to shield them from the fallout. But when the Post contacted her, she told them that if they found additional people, I would tell my story. I didn't go looking for this. It fell in my lap. So this is where then those on the right, not, all, not everybody, by the way, these are the only the people that are circling the wagons in Alabama around uh, Roy, uh, uh, Oh, no, around, uh, not even Roy, Roy Moore. It is they're circling the wagons around ideology and around the Republican Party because it's more important for them to make sure that they stay in control than it is to make sure that a, a, an alleged pedophile um, wins, in, wins in the election. And look, I, I, it's just amazing to me. And by the way, if no, you think and that, that doesn't make, Republicans. I'm not because the same exact thing will happen or has happened on the, well, Bill Clinton on the other side of things because he, Bill Clinton so loved that every allegation that came through of rape was fought tooth and nail. So this is politics. Don't think that this is about right wing, left wing stuff. Some of you are making it about right wing, left wing stuff. And that's bullshit. Yeah. It's ridiculous. 
Well, and you're exactly right. It, I'd rather it's, it's elect a, a pedophile. I'd rather elect yeah, a pedophile. That's a that's than, completely than, unacceptable. Then then vote in then allow the party of pedophiles. This is what I heard one guy say. Yeah. The part because Democrats are the party of pedophiles, according to this guy. So I'd rather reelect this guy than than the party of pedophiles. It's amazing how we justify our own shit in our head. And that's a big problem. I take an issue with that because what I tell people constantly, uh, especially nowadays, is is that I'm not a Republican or a conservative because of any one individual. Like to me, it's not about Trump or Marco Rubio or uh, what's the Republican Party mean, or, mean to you? What is the Republican Party? Being Republican means what to you? To me, it means uh, certain values and principles, small government, less taxation, free enterprise, capitalism, um, uh, pro-life. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's about a value system and a, pr- and a set of principles rather than any one individual. And, and I would sacrifice any individual to protect the values and the principles that I hold. But it's not true for a lot of those people in Alabama. Oh, you're absolutely right. Uh, it is more important for them to keep control, for the Republicans to keep control in Alabama, than it is to make sure. Sh- well, listen, I, and, I, and I, I, I'm not here to condemn Roy Moore. It's just uh, the hypocrisy that is, that is mind-numbing. And especially when religious people who are supposed to be the moral high ground get behind somebody like this because it's just about war for them. It's about war against the left. And they don't care who it is. It could be a pedophile that's leading them in the battle. It doesn't matter because they're going against the party of pedophiles, I guess, is the way that they rationalize it in their head. All right, next up, Melissa Gilbert accuses Oliver Stone of sexual harassment. It was humiliating and horrid. During an interview on Andy Cohen's uh, satellite radio show, Radio Andy, actress Melissa Gilbert claimed that the director, Oliver Stone, sexually harassed her during an audition for the 1991 film The Doors. At first, Gilbert told her story without naming names. This was an interesting part. She was going to tell the story and not name names. But then she said, F it. Uh, She kept the accusations very anonymous, saying that she was humiliated during an audition because she had, quote, embarrassed him in a social social situation. She didn't expound on that, or at least it's not in the story. Um, You know, how she embarrassed Oliver Stone in a social situation. So she says that Oliver Stone retaliated. Quote, I'm actually sitting here telling you the story, afraid to say his name. That's amazing. Melissa Gilbert's been in entertainment for 30 years. Yeah. 30 plus years. Yeah. You would think that she's got enough people around her where she doesn't have to worry about one person, even if it is Oliver Stone. Um, she said she ended up running out of the room crying. Quote, I'm actually sitting here telling you the story, afraid to say his name because I'm worried about the backlash. She said in the interview. After being reluctant, she eventually said, oh, F it. It was Oliver Stone. It was The Doors talking about the movie. She says the role she was auditioning for was Meg, uh, ended up being uh, the role that Meg Ryan played. She goes into detail about the scene she had or he had her, her read, a scene he said he wrote especially for her. The scene had her on her hands and knees saying, do me, baby, do me, baby. Uh, Gilbert said that Stone asked her to stage it and she refused and left to the audition crying. Quote, I never really talked about it, and it was all because I had said something and embarrassed him publicly. <clears throat> he wrote his, this special scene that he wanted me to do for him physically in the casting room, and it was humiliating and horrid. He got back at me, and it hurt. Is this in the same category, Johnny? Oh, yeah. I don't know what she did, but, but if she publicly embarrassed him in uh, one way, and he got back at her here... Uh, I, don't, I don't know if we put this in the same category. You, you two figure it out. You two are. Uh, it wasn't. He didn't. He didn't corner her alone and then uh, make up a scene on the spot. Uh, he, no, and it was something that was acted out. Um, you know, he didn't touch her. Or at least it didn't seem. Uh, it does. You know, he's not. She's not talking about him touching her. She's not talking about him. Um, put. You know, again, walking around naked. He's yeah. Not she the, didn't show up, and he's he's in a robe like yeah, Steven Seagal, right? Or Charlie Rose. <laughs> or, or or Louis C.K. Or, oh, he was uh, he he was uh, just in a robe in, a, in some of those allegations. Yeah, he came out uh, I think naked, or he'd whip it out from time to time. Uh, now this news comes after Stone backpedaled on his co- or actually uh, Gilbert's accusations against Stone is not the first. A former Playboy model, Carrie Stevens, claimed that the director groped her during a party. Stone has yet to respond to those allegations. 
Um, the news comes after Stone backpedaled on his comment about Harvey Weinstein, saying that it's not easy what he's going through in regards to the scandal. Poor Harvey. Uh, yeah. Also, when you see stuff like that come out of the mouth of other powerful people, it makes you wonder what is getting ready to come out about, well, you shouldn't be so hard on Bill Cosby. What? <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't be so hard on Harvey Weinstein. Aren't we up to like 60 people uh, that have allegations against that guy now? Well, I don't know about you, but when uh, you know I'm accused of things, I hop on my jet to Italy. <laughs> I mean, that's what I do. That's exactly what I would do. So that's what all uh, evil villains do. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> all right, so we're done. We're done with the uh, sex. Man, that, that was a, that was a, that was three quarters of our show. That was brutal. Damn it. Damn it. I, but see, it's that, in, that's it's, it's it's surprising how how worked up you get on the on the topic. And, and here's this is and this is why I understand why morning radio isn't going to stay on these topics. Because it was an hour and a half of heavy stuff. Sure. And yeah, we might have uh, made our, our jokes throughout or or tried to liven up the uh, conversation. But, man, that's an hour and a half of what would be heavy radio if this was on the radio. But I think this is what's going to set us apart, is, is that we can talk about issues like that uh, because, A, others won't and can't, right? Because some of these morning shows, I think, would love to talk about this stuff, but they can't because their program directors won't let them. Um, and the and fact that's most that, of them, by the way. Sure, yeah, of you course. Know, the the only morning shows that can that will be talking about this kind of stuff are your more personality driven. There's probably three in town that will be talking about this stuff. Everybody else, if if they have a news feature, it will be in the news, and that'll be right. It. right. It'll be a headline coming and, up. And, your thousand dollars song of the day. By the way, this is not a crack on any particular radio station. I don't know if anybody's doing a thousand. Uh, uh, Harvey, we got 10 more rapes in the news, but cut, don't stick around for your song of the day when we play it back to back with the sound effect of, a, of an elf. And we'll pay for your Christmas bills. I'm sorry, because I uh, sometimes I go back and forth. I go back and forth because sometimes yeah. I feel like maybe that is the place of radio. Maybe the place of radio is for people uh, to tune out see, when they tune in. I think I think there's a place for all of it. Just like there's a place for conservative talk radio, there's a place for liberal talk radio, and uh, not that they've been very successful at it, but you know, there's uh, there is a place for all of it, especially now, because I can open up my phone, I can go on iTunes, and I can look up a podcast on just about anything I want to hear, and so I think that there's a place for a show like this, uh, just like there's a, a place for you know Bob and Sherry. You know, Ooh. and uh, yeah, it's an old, oh, you know, che Miami? cheesy adult contemporary morning show. But I just, that was the first name that came to my head. Um, Bob and Sherry in the morning. So there, I, like I was saying, I, I, I can understand why they don't touch on these issues or they don't uh, get too deep into these issues. But I feel like we were part of the problem. We those of us doing radio, morning radio specifically, people are getting up in the morning, starting the day, what's going on? And we are part of the system. We are part of the the engine that helps Americans keep their head buried in the sand. Yeah. I guess that's my point. Well, and I, we I spend so because everything is such a focus on surface content, meaning yeah. let's just talk about the uh, stuff going on in pop culture. And if you want to talk about something that's kind of serious, make sure a celebrity couple is attached to it so we can all point our fingers at the celebrity couple and go that when the fact of the matter is whatever that celebrity couple's going through is exactly what you're going through <laughs> at home. And we'd probably be better served pointing our fingers at ourselves than at other people. Um, so I feel like something you know, like Lewis Black there for a second. Uh, I so I I feel like those of us in that part of the media, that part of the interstate entertainment industry, have to keep that in mind. Are we constantly going to be the frosting? Just 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 serve people up frosting. Every morning, a little spoonful of frosting, play three songs, and a little spoonful of frosting? Or can you find creative, entertaining, informative ways to include the more serious issues of the day so that when the next 9-11 happens, when the next market crash happens, and, well, well I, I know there's a certain percentage of the country's doing great now. Your 401, our 401ks are fine. But that was the top, you know, 10, 15, 20%. Everybody else is still effed after all that went down. And... I 
Are, are, is our role to be the band and the front of the ship of the Titanic? So when stuff's going down, you don't address it. You just sit there and you, you play your violin and let people focus in. Because I, I, can't, I can't think about all the other stuff happening around me. Just focus in on the meaningless frosting of the day. And then when the next collapse happens, we'll deal with it. I'll just deal with it then. Or do we in the media and morning radio have an obligation to help translate the hard to comprehend news of the world to package it in the right way, explain it to the people, not to try to instill fear and go, hey, we are on the Titanic and the, uh, the, you know, everything's you know, going to hell and you're not paying attention. It's, that's not the analogy I'm trying to draw here, yeah. that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. You need to pay attention. It's just, I don't know. No, maybe, look, maybe it's more. Maybe it's more a testament to more to the other side of the microphone, not those of us on this side, but everybody who's listening. I think that people, there's so much crap. I, and I, I'm sorry, Johnny. No, just okay. finish this thought, because you know, my, me and my idiot, I'll forget where I'm going with this. Um, that it's not our fault or our, but we are simply doing exactly what the millions on the other side of that speaker want. Yeah, because they know. They know there's shit going down in the Middle East. Yeah. We all know that there's poverty in the world and this and this. But when you go to each individual's life and you start to peel back the layers, you're going to see, man, they already got a lot of stuff on their plate. A lot of stuff that they're thinking about, a lot of the stuff that they're anxious about. So, man, it is a treat to be able to drive 40 minutes stuck in traffic in the morning, an hour in the morning to work, and just listen to some songs and uh, my favorite DJ come on and make a crack about the Kardashians or whoever's in the news today and I move on because all those monsters you're talking about fish. I know they're there. I know they're in the closet. I know they're under my bed. I just don't need to talk about them every day. And so maybe this is more of a me issue than it is a radio industry, a morning show, a media, a cultural issue. Now, no, I do. I do think it's a media issue and it's a cultural issue because there are people that are willingly avoiding this type of content because and some for valid reasons. Some because they have enough stress in their life and they don't want to hear it. Um, and others because they would uh, they would rather think that somebody else is the problem, like you said. Because they would right. rather point the finger at somebody else. And so, uh, you know, I think if that weren't the case, we wouldn't see TMZ be as powerful as it is. We wouldn't see uh, the housewife shows be as powerful as it is, or as you said, the Kardashians. Because those are true indicators of mainstream America, and and and, and what 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 our brains are <laughs> seeking out. Well, and 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 it gives them the opportunity to say, "Oh, look, they have everything, and they're still dysfunctional, and they still have problems, and they still, you know, and they're not better than me and my problems because look at them, they have everything, and they still have problems." Right, and then you get to sit there with your girlfriend and other girlfriend and the hairstylist. And talk about the celebrities of the day and put them down and point their fingers and judge them when the entire time, if I had a mirror on each one of those people sitting there gossiping, you'd be talking about yourself. You'd be yeah. talking about an aspect of your own life or one of the people that are sitting right in front of you. Yeah, That's oftentimes, the yeah, That's oftentimes the they are more concerned about the problems of the people that they are watching on TV than their own problems. And when I'm sitting there with grown-ass people and they're talking about uh, and all of a sudden they bring up a, a celebrity or something like that. And then multiple other adults at the table go, oh, my gosh, that is my favorite celebrity couple. <laughs> yeah, and and I, I just I look around and, and I, I can't relate. I can't relate. I don't have a do you have a favorite celebrity couple? Johnny Torres. <sighs> no. Brad and Angelina, are they still together? No. No, I'm just kidding. Maybe. I don't know. Who knows? I don't have. Uh, oh, yeah. My favorite uh, celebrity couple would be Bill Gates and his wife <laughs> and uh, what they do through the Gates Foundation. I guess that would be my favorite celebrity couple. <laughs> yeah. huh. All mine, right. would, mine would be uh, Elon Musk, and uh, I don't know who his counterpart is, but that's my favorite. That, that's, uh, he's, he's I don't think he has. I don't think. I never heard. I never, I never hear anybody referencing Mrs. It's just, Musk. It's just Elon Musk and whoever's next to him that day. You know, who, whoever he wakes up next to. Hey, Miss Musk. <laughs> All right, retailers are desperately trying to lure you in. We've got uh, this is uh, Thanksgiving week. We're thankful for a lot of things, 
And uh, one of those things is Black Friday. I'm sure a lot of people are thankful for. Um, with Black Friday just around the corner, retailers are getting creative to lure customers into their stores. Is there anything that will lure you into any store on Friday? Uh, no, not anymore. Not anymore. No. Uh, Walmart is throwing 20,000 parties. Jesus. Walmart is throwing 20,000 parties in November and December. Sears is putting its entire store on sale for the month of November. Macy's has a Samsung pop-up store in its flagship New York City location and virtually virtual reality headsets for furniture shoppers in some stores. J.C. Penney is giving customer coupons worth up to 500 bucks when they shop in stores on Thanksgiving Day. Yeah. The stores are desperate to get people to put down their phones and drive to the mall. Do you want to know why? Of course you do. They call it the Amazon effect. Hmm. Amazon, uh, when you can't beat them, join them. Retailers are taking cues from Amazon this holiday season. Amazon has built, been building up its retail presence by buying Whole, Whole Foods and striking deals with traditional retailers, including Kohl's. Getting customers into stores helps Amazon reduce delivery costs, notes uh, Tim Calkins, a marketing professor. Delivery is incredibly expensive. It is much more efficient if customers actually pick up the items themselves at the stores. Um. Well, and that's why they do the free shipping over a certain dollar amount because it, it's a loss for them. I think even at that minimum dollar amount, it's still a loss for them on delivery. Um, but, of course, they're making the markups on, on the products. Well, it is also amazing to me you know, what this has led to where you call them and go, I don't want this. I don't want this product anymore. Uh, this isn't right or this is the wrong one. I'll send it back and get another one. And if it's under a certain price, they go, no, 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 just keep it. We'll send you the other one. Because it's you know the the cost of shipping it back and restocking it and inventory yeah. all that, it 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 just doesn't make sense. Sure. And of course, some people have caught on to this and are working the uh, game. But there's a, I I don't know what goes on behind the scenes of uh, Amazon. How? But what another thing that amazes? How often do you get stuff uh, delivered to your house from Amazon? No, n- not never. very often. Never. So my wife will order some makeup. The makeup it probably would fill. It's about the size of a shot glass. Yeah. Okay? Right. Maybe she gets two of them. Sorry, not, you're like nail even, polish or foundation yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're like, uh, nail polish. She'll order a nail polish. There's yeah, a good one, right. which is the size of a shot glass. Sure. That thing will come in a box that is, you know, two feet by a foot by a foot. <laughs> It'll be a box inside a box. Uh-huh. And it happens over and over again. I So, again, I'm thinking this can't be. You would think that this is not economically viable. This is inefficient. But Amazon knows, and their AI and their robots know what they're doing. That's right. So it makes more sense for them not to accept returns for some items, and it makes more sense for them to shop thing, ship things in boxes this big, even though the thing is only this big. But I guess it doesn't really matter when it comes to that kind of stuff because it goes by weight, right? It goes by weight, not by size. I've, I've uh, become far less uh, materialistic, I'd say, over the last 10 years. And there is nothing that I want that would get me out to a store or even online for that matter uh, for Black Friday. Uh, there is one thing for me. A new laptop? No. My <laughs> wife telling me that I have to go stand in line for something. There is one thing. That is my wife goes, hey, I have a job for you on Friday. I need you to stand in line over here. And when they do this, I need you to do that. That would be that I would end up in a. But other than that, I have not gotten those orders. Yeah. And I even asked, you know, granted, it was last week when I asked, do I need to set it some? Do I need to help you out? You know, come, uh, you know, Black Friday. She said, no, no, no. Me and my mom should have it handled. Uh, so, fortunately, my ex uh, wasn't into that stuff either. So uh, we didn't uh, do Black Friday when we were together either. So. Good for you. Yeah, I got lucky. You shouldn't have got rid of her. <laughs> um, Seminole Heights Killer, the reward has been uh, increased to $110,000. The reward, reward money for information that helps solve the Seminole Heights homicides has now increased to $110,000. We had that stuff you should know at the beginning of the show. Uh, speaking of which, share, share, share. If you can do us a favor and share this uh, every single day when you get a chance, um, we really appreciate that. Um, but uh, it was at $91,000 a week ago. And we even joked then. I was like, all right, come on, man. Somebody, somebody's got to pony up that 9000 make it an even a hundo. And somebody did. That was... Richard Gonsmart. Richard Gonsmart yep. gave that $9,000 on Monday. And then uh, David A. Stras Jr. added $10,000 to bring that total to $110,000. Now that it's over $100,000, yeah. do you think that some, 
first of all, do you think somebody knows? Do you uh, think there are people in that area that know? I think there's somebody that knows. I definitely think there's somebody that knows, but I don't think the dollar amount makes the difference. I mean, I think even at 90, when that, I mean, I just, I think it's, I don't know that, that oh, now that it's over $100,000, now somebody's going to step forward. Um, I, I certainly think it, it, it's encouraging, right? And I think it's going to make people just generally more vigilant in that area. But is it a motivator for somebody that may know something? Like, I don't think those $10,000 made a difference. I mean, I think it's very cool that, you know, these very successful entrepreneurs, whether it's something like this or the Confederate statue, whether you are for or against it, I think uh, regardless, you can at least step back from the politics of that situation and be like, you know, it's really cool that these, uh, you know, successful individuals in our community were willing to pony up a large amount of money to make something happen, uh, something positive happen in the community. Crime Stoppers, ATF, FDLE, and the FBI are offering $85,000. <clears> you got to be careful about that stuff, too, because we make the assumption that uh, so all of a sudden you call the cops and say, I know who this guy is. And they get them. You think you get one hundred and ten thousand dollars? You don't. You have to call Crime Stoppers first. Did you know that? No. Damn it. Because that will be a news story every now and again. How somebody helped with an investigation, they didn't get anything. Wow. Because it's not like Crime Stoppers. I guess is just some you know charitable organization out there. They they have a system, and so you got to call them first. Say hey, blah de blah. And then I guess you call the cops afterwards or something. Oh, weird. Yeah. Uh, anyone with any... So anyway, they're poning up 85. And then uh, the Seminole Heights community themselves added six grand. And then we uh, just documented the others. Anyone with information in the case, call Crime Stoppers <laughs> at 808. Don't call the cops. The, the asterisk. It's a, the, the, the fine print in that situation. Also, if that doesn't make any sense to you, I mean, no, Fitch, if I, if I see who this is, this is I, I'm not calling crime. I'm going to call the cops. Well, you live in America. Money comes first. <laughs> Remember, no matter what anybody tells you, in America, when, when push comes to shove. Money talks. Money comes first. Yeah. Call Crime Stoppers first, then you can call 911. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for those people here in the Bay Area, and if you're not watching in the Bay Area, you have this stretch of road probably in your area. Uh, we have US-19, and drivers are begging, begging law enforcement to do something. Now, every single year, they put out this list of the most deadliest, the, the, the deadliest roads in America. Yeah. There's stretches of US-19 here in the Bay Area that will be on that list every single year. I've heard it's because the, those, those lanes are so wide, you know? And so straight that, well, you don't have that everywhere, you know, in other parts of the country because it's constantly winding and, you know, roads are, you know, twisting and turning and this and that. Oh, I thought you were joking. I don't find US-19 to be wide or straight. What? Okay. What part of US-19 are you driving? I don't know, but I mean, I be, well, the width thing, I don't know. I mean, it, it, oh, once but, you get up in the Newport Ritchie area and, uh, man, I mean, that that's that's eight eight lanes you got eight lanes that you're working with there. Uh, see, I usually, I'm only in like the Pinellas area. And even still, it's like windy and stuff when you're up in the Clearwater area. It kind of winds around. And well, I think you're talking about all the construction. <laughs> there is. Okay, not not all of US-19, but I, that's why I said stretches of US-19. Got 19. it, okay. All right. So anyway, uh, drivers call it Death Valley, a stretch of US-19 between Curlew and East Klosterman, where within the past five years, 2,000 people have been hurt and 17 killed. On Sunday, a rollover crash near US-19 in Alderman backed up traffic for blocks and terrified drivers that have been begging for something to be done to make the highway safer. The people who are driving along that stretch are begging FHP and Pinellas to do something. Drivers say the real problem is with speeders and distracted drivers putting themselves and others at risk. I, the distracted drivers thing, of course, we can talk about. The texting while driving now, it is, it's mind-blowing how many people are drifting into your lanes now. Yeah, You're driving... And somebody's car just slowly starts to drift in your effing lane. You honk on the horn, they jerk the wheel, and uh, they're back on their Facebook. Well, sorry about that. Uh, somebody messaged me. And it's also, by the way, it's not kids. You know, try to blame this all on uh, teenagers oh, no. and uh, you know, 17-year-old girls. Yeah. Because what's blowing, matter of fact, I would take, I'd rather, if there are two people driving down the road on their phones like that, I would much rather be in the proximity of the 17-year-old, the teenager, than I would a 50-year-old man in his work truck doing the same thing. 
because that kid was raised being uh, with, with being able to do 50 million things at one time while they're on their phone. Sure. The 50-year-old man who is uh, trying to get to the work site and do whatever he's doing on his phone. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I will, I'd rather be next to the teenager. And, and, and the reason that I bring this up is because it seems like when we go down this path and have this talk, it, it gets directed towards the millennials. Yeah. And it is complete BS. Yeah. I'm on the road all the time. I'm on the road early in the morning when there's more work trucks on the road than there are other vehicles. Yeah. And the amount because work truck there those are those are those vehicles are twice my the size of my vehicle. So I notice those a little bit more when they're drifting into my lane. Oh yeah. And also those are the guys that bitch the the first about millennials about this about that. Yet you're still, you're doing the same exact thing. You know what fascinates me are the people that in 2017 and with a fairly new car still hold the phone to their ear while they're driving. That's me. Really? No Bluetooth? And you have a nice car. I I think I I probably have to break out Bluetooth again. But because, you know, when I first went to Bluetooth 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was just too spotty. There was always, can you hear me now? All that crap that went along with it. And so I just, and not only that, but I also feel like, I could be wrong, but I feel like that I'm a better driver. Oh, no, definitely with, not. With, with the phone up to my ear like this. No. Because I'm going to say that's a big negative. You're probably right, but I, I will say <laughs> that when, I've, when I'm doing the wire, the, the Bluetooth, and I've got, it is... I don't know. I, I don't know what it is, but I, it's like it's it's more distracting when it is Bluetooth and stuff like that for me than if I'm sitting up here. But I mean, you, then you only got one hand on the wheel, and I'm probably not safer. Uh, is that illegal yet? Am I am I allowed to talk on the phone? Uh, depends on where you're at, but I mean, uh, yeah, you're definitely not driving better while you're on the phone. I mean, because your mind is thinking about the conversation. Your mind is processing what you're saying, uh, who you're talking to, and all that stuff. You know, like, for example, I driving up from Miami Sunday night. You know, I had my Bluetooth on, and I was chatting with a friend pretty much uh, the entire way. And it was awesome because the, the drive went by quick. Yeah. I mean, and so, you know, it made a, a three-and-a-half, four-hour drive go by quick. Uh, and, and before I knew it, I was home. The other problem that they're talking about on US-19, and this is the one I really want to address, is the speed. Mm. Um, the aggressive drivers here in the Bay Area, in Orlando, in Miami, and I'm sure Jacksonville, you know, is like another thing that is mind-numbing to me. Um, how we're driving these multi-ton vehicles that can kill in an instant. And for some reason, 70 miles an hour isn't fast enough for somebody. I've been seeing a lot of speeding lately. A hundred. Oh, look, we just judge. Uh, what's her name? Shapiro, the yeah. chick from uh, Fox News. Right. Just got. I mean, this is not even a young male. This is an sure. older woman. Yeah. And she just uh, got a ticket for 119 miles an hour. Now, listen, if there's that's nobody a, on. That's an that's an arrestable offense. Right. If there's nobody else on the road and, uh, you know, you're you're young and you, 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 you just you just have that urge. I get it. I understand. But the, the way that people drive here in the Bay Area, and I'm all around the country, darting in and out of traffic, putting everybody's life at risk on the road because they don't give a shit, because they'll do whatever they want, whenever they want. And I'll, I'll go cutting cars off, I'll drive on the shoulder, go 100 miles an hour. Oh, by the way, uh, even though you're going 80, 10 miles an hour over the speed limit, I'm going to ride your ass where you can't even see my headlights to try to get you out of the way because you're not going fast enough. Yeah. 10 miles an hour over the speed limit isn't fast enough. Um, it, uh, anyone going under the speed limit annoys me. Yeah. But, but if you're unless, going... Unless if I you're see going, 90. If, yeah, if you're going over the speed limit, uh, even, if you're going the speed limit or over. slightly over the speed limit, all right, cool, I'll get over, you know, or, you know, or I think you should, you know, um, I'm not going to give you a hard time, you know, but I'm not going to ride my bumper No, And I got, you know, I don't know. I just, I'm not going to say I, I don't like, you know, in a pinch, you know, I might speed, but I've kind of gotten that out of my system for the most so, part. What, I'm big on the cruise control. Actually, I, I love cru- using my cruise control. I'm always in cruise control, uh, because I have, I don't know what they call it. I call it smart cruise, but it's not called that. I don't think and it'll keep you in pace with the people in front of you. Oh, cool. Uh, the cars. In, do you have that? No. 
you have the estate. Oh man, this thing! If you're if you're already a, an auto cr- or a cruise control kind of a guy, yeah. The next vehicle you get, make sure you get this function, yeah. And it's got infrared sensors out in the front, so you and just it slows down. Yeah, you set it and forget it. <laughs> and then you come you come flying up onto the uh, bumper of somebody. It's slow, puts you in pace, and uh, you know backs you up, and you don't have to touch anything. Um, I'm sure my Tesla Model Three will probably just drive for me. So, I'm sure that I'm sure that know. it will. Um, <laughs> We're almost. We don't got hell. Living wage ordinance. Do we touch on that? Yeah, I just want to see touch what other on the ra- we only touch got to on the ra- raccoon. Yeah, sanctuary city funding. Oh, you did, you you also mentioned that. What the uh, this Mediter- uh, Genghis Khan Mediterranean Grill? I think what I might do is message him and see about getting him on the show. Yeah, that'd be cool. That guy did. Uh, wasn't this the same guy opened his place up uh, for the hurricane? Yep, and uh, was just serving people off the street for free, and now he's yeah. going to do. Uh, thousands of Thanksgiving turkeys for those in need in uh, Tampa at Genghis Khan Mediterranean Grill. Never been yeah. uh, there in Tampa. But, yeah, when the Hurricane Irma blew through, he made uh, headlines by converting his dining room into a shelter. in The Tampa restaurant housed and fed 150 people off the street. One of the cool things about the story, why I wanted to bring it up, is uh, one, of the th- one of his quotes. Uh, the owner, Eric, or Ergen, Ergen, Teak, or Tech, a 38-year-old USF grad from Turkey, isn't done helping people in South Tampa. He goes, I tell you what, I've mastered the science of helping people. That's why I want to have him on the show. That's a great, that's a, that's a great skill to have. I've mastered the science of helping people. That's why I want to have this guy in the show. Yeah. Tech is now turning his attention to Thanksgiving in a big way. He is preparing to cook thousands of turkey dinners out of Genghis Kong's uh, kitchen for local churches and synagogues to feed the needy in the area. This includes hungry mouths from Puerto Rico, chased off by... Uh, chased off the island by Hurricane Maria. Uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna uh, we'll see if we can track down that guy and get cool. him on the show. Yeah. Up next, okay. What we just talked. Well, what's the fastest you ever went? Uh, you've ever gotten a vehicle up to? Um, in Germany, I got it up to about 115, but that on the, autobahn on the autobahn, but and I was 17 at the time. So. Oh, good for you. But that was legal, so. I. Uh, there was a there was a oh, time, okay. you know, like, a, you know, my early adulthood, I wasn't somebody who would like to speed or I would speed, but, you know, like 10 miles an hour, 15 miles an hour over. I'm not trying to go as you know, fast as I can. Uh, but I finally got a cool car, it, you know, a sports car, and it was a Nissan 240 SX, I believe it was. Okay. It wasn't the sportiest of cars, but it was yeah. still a sports car. And I think it was that. It was either that or the Pathfinder. Anyway. Oh, no. The Pathfinder I had actually had a governor on it at 85. Huh. That sucks. No, uh, I, I, an SUV doesn't need to go faster than 85. Yeah. All right, because uh, that thing will roll quickly. So I, I tried to get that up to, you know, see how fast it would go. But I remember cracking the 100 MPH uh, uh, mark, and I was it was exhilarating. I was scared out of my yeah. mind. I was by myself driving down to Miami on 95, not 75, 95. And I was like, all right, there's nobody on the road, middle of the night. Just, you know, up there in fifth gear, and I just uh, just pressed the gas just to see how fa- fast it would go, and I can't remember if it was. I know I crossed over the 100-mile-per-hour mark, but I don't know if it was 105 or 110 or 110. What happened? Um, I would say here in the United States, uh, I've probably hit 105 that I can remember, maybe maybe 110, but I think 105 is probably but it's one, all, 100, 105. It's all, but how do you have a conversation with especially young males? To help curb those moments when you're in the car and you're and you've got and then you've got that lane you want a, a clear cut and you're ready to go and you punch it, yeah. You know you just there's just something about that you know. Uh, so how do you get through? Hey, in those moments, take a deep breath. Remember, you're driving a rocket. You're driving a bullet that can you know, kill, kill people. Yes. Sir? So Ken Gibson from the Crisis Center is ready to talk with you. He's on Facebook. All right. Sure, sure. Let's do it. All right. <clears throat> Well, again, while you uh, right, pull that name? up. What's the name? Hey, oh, Ken. While, uh, while you go ahead and pull that up, again, just a reminder. Thank you, everybody, uh, for watching, first of all, uh, or listening, uh, however you start your day. Uh, thank you, as always, uh, Chris, David, uh, for all your comments. Uh, David chimed in earlier. He said, uh, we, we already have radio stations we can tune into and forget about life and stations that push their agendas. I would just like a show that talks about the issues and just reports, reports the story in a fun, creative way. So that's us. Yeah, man. All right, I got Kim Gibson pulled up. I just uh, I'm messaging him hi right now. 
And now I'm going to uh, hit that button. It should pull him. Unfortunately, Safari does not support your new video call. <laughs> so now I'm going to switch back over to uh, Google. And then Chris uh, says uh, his wife, aunt, and sister-in-law all go together on Black Friday, and he gets to stay home. Good for you, buddy. Yeah, man. So uh, we're going to be talking to the Crisis Center in Tampa Bay here in a minute. But uh, in the meantime, if you don't mind, just giving us a share. Tell your you, friends to like the page. You uh, Have you ever had any uh, any issues at all with uh, melancholy? Any any, any dark uh, phases in your life? Oh, uh, yeah, once. I was in a pretty rough relationship and... Uh, and, and you know, to the point of, uh, yeah, where, where I was like, okay, maybe I need to see somebody, you know, emotionally it was, uh, I would say borderline abusive. Yeah. So there we go. Uh, but never to the point where you like, you know, screw life. I'm, I'm ready to check out. No, fortunately not. I mean, I've, I've had a good support system at home and, um, it's saying not reachable, have a, have a good, uh, have a good relationship with, uh, my parents and more so my mom who, I'm able to open up to, so you know I've been fortunate to at least always have somebody I can I can lean on. Is he the Kim Gibson that uh, stu- Ken. or Ken Ken Gibson that studied at Queens University and lives in Clearwater? I want to make sure I'm calling the right Ken Gibson. No. That's not him. No. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. My bad. Did he send you a friend request? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, wrong Ken. Uh, message me. Message me direct. Chris Fisher five four three two one. Chris Fisher five four three two one. Yeah, I don't know that we can do video messaging through the page. Although that'd be I, good to know. I, yeah, we, we can check, but I don't think so. Uh, sorry, wrong Ken. <laughs> that was the only Ken Gibson that uh, popped up. I will right, we'll talk to them here in just one second. But um, and I and I love doing the stuff. That matter of fact, uh, uh, that's how I met Johnny Torres. Uh, he and I were both doing a uh, charity gig for them. Uh, over the summer, and that's how we first made contact, and I got to know the people here at uh, Bake More Pies. Yeah. Uh, but one of the reasons why I do uh, donate my time every single year is because I have my bouts with melancholy, we'll call it. Okay. And I've you know, never been officially diagnosed with anything, but I can definitely get the points in my head where I'm like, what the F it all. You know, screw this. I'm out. And have to fight through those moments. Wow. Um, yeah, and uh, it's... He's here? Oh, there you are. Ken Gibson wants to connect with me. All right. Oh, you lucky guy. There you go. And it's tough because it's one of those things that it's <laughs> it's especially difficult to understand. Top right, uh, hit the little video. Oh, uh, uh, it's especially difficult uh, to understand if you've never gotten to that point in your life. And, and so well, while... I feel disconnected from it in many ways. I Good, also, I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, but I, I certainly feel for those that suffer through that. Right He's going to call him or? Oh, there we go. Well, you know, when my, uh, my grandmother passed a couple of years ago, she lived a long, long life. And, uh, you know, she, she talked a little bit about that, like the week prior yeah. to passing. She, she basically said she spent her life happy. She didn't understand those people who had, uh, you know, we would hear stories of friends like they couldn't get out of bed in the morning, just couldn't mm. get out of bed, and she couldn't wrap her head around that. And I'm glad you can't either, yeah, because uh, it, it 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 sucks. No, and and there are people who are very insensitive to it because they don't understand. You know, oh, they're like, real jerks. Yeah, like snap out of it or you just know, kill just, yourself. Just yeah, kill yourself. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's um. So go full screen on him if you don't mind. I surely will. I'm going to go full screen on you, Ken. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> How have you been? I'm doing good. Good to see you. And good to see you, and welcome to the new show. What do you think? Thank you. I think it's awesome. Because uh, we've had, we, I had you in on my last show, which was on an AM station, a very yeah. traditional radio kind of a thing, and uh, it's good to have you on the new show. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and glad to be glad to be part of it. All right. I want to talk uh, talk to you guys uh, so we can get some information out there because of the uh, holidays that time of year, and of course, as we're all talking about how. Uh, this time of year makes so many fills so many people with jo- joy and hope and positive feelings this time of year man it is the exact opposite for other people sure sure and it's it kind of it kind of goes both ways um you know you it's a time of year where some people it's it's the peak of their year they're doing fine and even if they're struggling uh through the rest of the year uh they're spending time with families and it, and it's a it's a it's a good experience but on the other side of things, there are people out there who are alone, 
and uh, may not have a, a support system around them. And for them, it can be very, it can be very lonely time of year. And it, it, it can trigger, trigger things in a similar way that Facebook and social media triggers that kind of melancholy because they look around. It seems like everybody around them is happy and they're having a good time and are having fun with life, yeah, except right. for them. They start to feel even more and more withdrawn alone. Sure. Well, I think just just like anything else on social media, people use social media to kind of show that put their best foot forward. Yeah. Um, so most people are not going to uh, communicate the struggles, and you know, like like here's a good example. Okay, uh, I see this on on my social media is that is that you have you have those those parents who will. Uh, who will show their kids straight A's and show their kids are on the honor roll and that sort of thing? They aren't, you know, the parents whose kids came home with D's. They're not posting that report card on Facebook, no. but that, that's out there. That's happening. So it they're posting. You have, you have to kind of keep the social media in check. All right. So uh, there at the uh, Tampa Crisis Center, as you guys go into the holidays, do you do you guys ramp up anything? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, one more? of the things that we do is uh, we work with with families throughout the year who are experiencing crisis and trauma in their lives. And so during the holidays, one of the things we do is a holiday giving program where we have businesses in the community who will um, uh, donate toys, um, gift cards that we provide to the, to the kids and families that, that we help uh, throughout the course of the year. And then obviously if somebody is struggling uh, this time of year, we, we do have a, a contact center. We answer the two-on-one calls for Hillsborough County. We answer local calls for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So if somebody is struggling, they can give a call to two-on-one 24 hours a day and connect to the support that they, that they really need. So even me here in Pinellas County, if I if I just dial 211, send, it's not a pound 21, it's just 211. It's just, yeah, it's just 211. And and the way it works is that there's different there's different organizations that answer 211. Uh, provide emotional support, and one of the part of the, the big thing that Two and One does is, is it connects people to community resources. So if you're going through a difficult time and you know there's organizations that can help you, by calling Two and One, you can have a conversation with somebody who will connect you to support. And it works in every county in the state of Florida. So we answer we answer it for Hillsborough County, but it's Two and One is answered in every county in Florida. So what happens if somebody calls a Two and One? I uh, I'm just going to throw out a random scenario. Yeah. Say uh, you know. Yeah, you're you're in a, you're in a place, and you're, you're trying to um, uh, connect with, say, somebody you like. I will call, say, your wife or your husband, mm-hmm. and uh, that person doesn't seem to understand at all what it is you're going through in that moment, and is even at even piling on to whatever's happening in your head. When sure. when, the, when that person calls two one one and goes, "Hey, man, I just need someone to talk to." What what kind? Because I would imagine it's not as simple as hey, uh, I I just need someone to talk to, and they go yeah, go ahead. What's going on? I'm sure you know, they have to get your name and some basic information. They have to ask you, are you are you you know about to hurt yourself or somebody else? I'm sure there's some of that stuff in the beginning, right? Sure, they're they're tra- and one of the things they're not gonna they're not gonna do is ask you your name, it and that's okay. They, they it's a confidential call, so um, you're gonna speak privately with somebody in, in terms of of what you're going through. And they're the, the the specialists there. They receive uh, they receive very in depth training in terms of having these sort of calls and providing emotional support. And one of the things they're going to do is they're going to ask questions to kind of dig to the to the root of what you're going through, um, because the reason you're calling may be a symptom, but it may not be the root of the problem. So by what we we basically call it sitting with them, kind of sitting with them on the phone, finding out what's going on asking additional questions and from there that we might get down to a to a root cause and there may be um some some support that we might be able to connect that person to and so then 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 that person connects you to to whoever could who can help you now are yeah, th- exactly. those those people that initially answer the phone are those volunteers or those social workers what kind of background do they have there it's a combination it's it's people who um um they, they, they have college degrees social work psychology um, many of them are training to um, uh, maybe working on a master's degree, um, and uh, but they have experience in term and training. Um, and a big part of it is that they have the um, uh, the heart to be able to help somebody, but at the same time they're able to balance it where they can take multiple calls and, and themselves be able to uh, to process that and, and not get overwhelmed emotionally by by the calls that come in. What what if somebody calls? They're in a bad place, but they're also you can tell that they're on something. You can tell by their their state that there is an uh, something in their system, even if you can't figure out what it is. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, that's 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 actually interesting. Is one of the things that we do is um, 
we, we actually also answer statewide calls for the Florida Substance Abuse Hotline. So we have uh, addiction resources throughout the entire state of Florida that we can connect people to. So, and it, so we get specific calls about addiction. And so if we recognize that somebody might be having a substance, and, and that may be part of the questioning is like, okay, what are you taking? That sort of a thing. And um, what are you on? I'm not judging you. I just need rehab to, resources. So you're like, oh, what are you on? I'm not judging you, but I just need you to be honest with me so we can figure this thing out. Yeah, yeah. Are you, are you, are you drinking? Or did, did you take some opioids? That sort of a thing. And um, you know, and then obviously, if somebody is in danger, we will try to try to talk to them, find out find out you know where they are, and and send intervention if we need to. So they're so they're safe. Hey Ken, it's Johnny. Uh, just a hey quick, Johnny. So uh, again, I don't know if you kind of heard the first part of our conversation on this, but uh, you know, I've been fortunate to not have uh, these type of issues. Uh, and uh, and could, so, you, could you ask the question? The, the audio broke apart for a second. Could you ask the question again? Okay. No, yeah. So no, I was just kind of laying the, the groundwork leading up to the question, which is, uh, you know, I personally have been fortunate to not have these these struggles. But uh, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, you know, there were two friends of mine who passed away this year. Uh, and so when we look at those kind of situations where maybe there's been a year of deaths in the family and uh, and holidays is when that hits hardest, uh, might you be able to share some coping mechanisms, uh, some some tips as to how best to deal with that through the holidays? Sure. I mean, one of the things that we do with, with people is what we do, safety planning, if they have a... a um, um, uh, having having some thoughts where they're where they're struggling emotionally. The very first thing, and and, and uh, you know, I I think it's important for me to, to lay out that that I am not a like a licensed clinical social worker. I'm the I'm the marketing director here, but I work very closely with the individuals that are providing direct support. So I kind of am familiar with the sort of help that they that they provide. And um, the very first thing is is don't be afraid to to seek help. Um, if you're having those thoughts, um, for one thing, you can call two and one. Um, you can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is 1-800-273-TALK, um, and th that's one thing. Um, another thing is just seek out a safe person. If you have somebody that you can trust, that you can have, have a conversation with, that you can even spend time with, um, sometimes just by spending time with somebody, you will make you feel less lonely. If you have a friend or family member, that sort of a thing. And don't that, feel that like you're putting them out. Relationship with. Don't feel like you're putting that friend or family member out. They don't want to hear my right. stuff again. That might even be true that they don't want to hear your stuff again. But if you have that person in your life, they will listen to it again. Uh, you know, if uh, they will, if they're a friend or a family member, they will listen to yeah. it and help you out. So. Yeah, and it's it's important to take care of yourself. That's you know, if you, a way to counterbalance some of those negative feelings is to is to do things that will be that that you enjoy. And um, you know, obviously, we would not recommend drinking, and you know, that's that's going to make things worse. But in terms, what about of pot? What, what about marijuana? <laughs> Once again, we're not going to push substance abuse, you know, substances or anything like that. Um, we would recommend perhaps you enjoy going to the beach, hanging out on the beach, that sort of a thing, uh, positive activities in that sense. Yeah, I've always heard helping out other people makes you feel better, too, if you get into those Absolutely. moves. Just get out and yeah. help somebody else. Man, I can't even get out of bed. Much less get up and help somebody out, uh, you know, else out right now. And that's that's what sucks about depression, those kinds of things, too, is that they are smir it's, it's spiraling, it's compounding, and the things that will – a lot of those things that will help you make you feel better, working out, getting out, and just sort yeah. of – Yep. Those things are almost, in, for some people, can be insurmountable. Yes, it's easy to say if you just did A, B, and C, uh, it might help you know turn things around. But sometimes it's a lot of times it's easier said than done. And that's that's one of the things that we that we do is is through those conversations is is ask them okay what sort of things do you enjoy, and and that's part of the safety plan that we develop with them is is do you you know do you enjoy playing guitar. Uh, do you enjoy uh, cooking and just encouraging them? And we actually will also, for people who are having thoughts of suicide, uh, we have staff members who, if they, ch if the person chooses to say, okay, this is my name, this is my phone number, uh, we'll actually make follow-up calls to them. We'll put them, okay. in, them into what's called a care coordination program, where we'll actually take those safety plan notes and encourage them to, and, and that can be, the encouragement can be those positive activities. It can also be counseling as well and making sure and that, that they're connecting to the help that they need. And back to Johnny's uh, question, uh, Ken. And it, uh, uh, last year, this, we're coming up on the anniversary this year of uh, one of my cousins committing suicide. Mm -hmm. 17. Wow. 17 years old. We still don't know why. Yeah. Um, it, uh, it seemed very abrupt and sudden to everybody around him. 
Um, how, how do we as family members and friends support um, those families during the holidays or when those anniversaries come up? I know that can be very uh, uh, awkward because mm-hmm. um, you want to make sure you say and do the right things without yeah. you know, sending them into a, a hysterical crying fit. Um, but at the same time, uh, how are there some, are there, if, if we went back to my, my co- the, the previous year of my cousin's life, and I know this is the kind of things that are driving, uh, my cousin, his, his mother and father insane was trying to go, what could, could we have seen something? Could we have caught something? What should parents be looking for in their teens you know, as their teenagers are getting to that age, because a lot of the a lot of those signs that they say to look out for are also the same signs of just average, you know, just going through phases in your teen years. Sure, All of a sudden, sure. you, you know, you're a little bit more antisocial. You're dressing in black. Uh, well, it, oh, was my son getting ready to kill himself? That is not necessarily the case. So how do you, you know, what do you do? Um, I, I think, you know, if you if you have a, a, a child who, who, who you know, uh, says, you know, says that they're, you know, I want, I want to kill myself, that sort of thing. Don't brush that off. Right. right. Um, you know, uh, sit down, talk with them. Um, once again, uh, if, you, if you're in that situation and you have a, and you have a teen or a child who's, who you're concerned about, call 2 and one and have a conversation with the specialist. You can call 24 hours a day. And uh, they'll they will um, uh, talk with you, perhaps give you some advice, maybe even connect you to, to resources. Um, but it, in terms of the of the warning signs, not everybody there are warning signs, but not everybody will exhibit those warning signs. Right. But um, you know, if 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 somebody gets withdrawn, um, if they um, uh, talk about feeling worthless, that people would be better off without them, if they start giving things away, uh, those are all those are all warning signs and, and things that should be that should be acknowledged and. and where you may want to try to connect them to to help and support, but uh, th- not everybody. Goes, each person's different in terms of how they they process. So there are going to be people out there who I, kind of wear that wear that face, and you don't you don't you don't realize what they're what they're going through. Um, you know, but you know, I, I think the the uh, it's, it it re- reiterates the importance of of uh, being you know contributing to your community, being you know talking with people, spending time with them. Um, check really truly checking in and seeing how they're doing, and uh, maybe then that, that you know your friends and family might be you know might be open up, maybe go a little deeper with them in terms of just uh, how their life is going and stuff like that. On uh, the Wake Dot Show today, we have uh, Ken Gibson from the Tampa Bay uh, Crisis Center, and two one one is a very important phone number. But two one one isn't just about those who are on the verge or feel like they are going to commit suicide. No, kill no, it's, it, it's not. You, it's it, you guys it goes are connected. You guys are connected to a lot. Uh, the, the setup here was you guys are connected to a lot of things. Uh, so, um, as Cords pointed out earlier, if you guys have a friend that comes to you and says they have just been uh, sexually assaulted and sure. they don't know what to do, they can call two and one. You guys yeah. have the resources to handle that as well. Sex, sexually assaulted, sexually harassed. Um, you know, we, part of what we do as an organization is that we're the rape crisis center for Hillsborough County. So we work directly with sexual assault survivors. In terms of, uh, we have victim advocates on staff who work with them, who will uh, even go go into a courtroom and, and sit with them to provide emotional support. We have trauma counseling. Uh, so if somebody, and that that goes back to uh, whether the 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 harassment or assault took place a, a week ago or 20 years ago, counseling uh, is available to be able to help people through that uh, through that struggle that they're going through. And before we get you off uh, uh, off the stream today. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the veterans because you guys, uh, it's, yeah. it's also an important part of your mission is to make sure that those veterans are taken care of. Yeah, it's it's um, a few years ago we actually um, launched a, a pilot program uh, called the Florida Veterans Support Line, and that's a toll-free number um, that veterans can call to connect to both veteran resources and non-veteran related resources, uh, the, the, whole, the whole process. And it's something that um, is available to all veterans. So if you, if you serve one day in the military, you can call that number. And uh, even if you're not qualifying for VA resources, there may be other community resources or veteran specific resources that are available to you um, for all veterans that we can connect you to. Um, and that number is one eight four four myfl vet um, in the case of what we're doing in the Tampa area, we have vet specialists uh, where the veteran is talking to another vet. 
Um, that number is actually going to expand throughout the entire state of Florida and be answered by other two-in-one systems. It won't be to the point where they have peer-to-peer -peer vet specialists, but they, they, it is a number that they can call and connect to veteran resources and, and also emotional support, just be able to sit and talk with them and pro provide the same sort of service that we're providing through the two-in-one system. Ken Gibson from uh, Tampa Bay Crisis Center. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Good to see you, Chris. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Bye-bye. Uh, I guess this was a heavy show from beginning to end, huh? <laughs> Couldn't get out of it. Couldn't get out of it. That's all right, you know. But again, I mean, I, I what I love is 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 something like that that we were able to pull in that interview at the last minute. Uh, it's a valuable interview, and we don't have to worry about some other show coming on after us or anything like that. That we can go long if we need to uh, when it's worthwhile. Right, we're not rushed out of the studio. Yeah. Uh, thank you once again for being a part of the Wake Dot Show. Make sure you share, tell your friends. Um, uh, we're very excited about this broadcasting lot. Streaming live. You can say broadcasting. It is broadcasting. We're streamcasting. <laughs> streamcasting live. It is a uh, from uh, uh, Bake More Pies in Tampa. Like and share. Like and share. And that's it for today. Unless you got something else, sir. No, just uh, uh, you know, tomorrow should be fun. We'll see kind of where we both end up, and uh, you know, as we we attempt to do the show remotely out of the studio, out in the wild. Uh, you know, and uh, so far the tests look good, so I'm excited to see what happens so, tomorrow. So will I be coming here, or, or we will both be at our different places, and you're going to do what you did last night? Yeah, let, uh, I thought oh, that, that was cool. the idea. That so. is cool. That is cool. Then you can have the Yorkies on the show. That is cool. All right, so I'll make sure my back. Mine are in Miami, so uh, no, Yor no Yorkies unless I head down there tonight. Yeah, get so. down. Let's uh, put, you know, <laughs> do an all Yorkie show. Get yours in the background. <laughs> I'll have mine in the background. There we go. So, um, And thank you again for bar being part of the uh, Wake Dot Show. For more information on the Wake Dot Show, uh, well, it's, it's just pretty pretty much keep watching. We'll give you all the information you need. Go to the Wake Dot Show. The Wake Dot Show. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>